Hello, Open Center audience. Um, welcome. We're, we're a little bit late checking in this afternoon. We had some going live problems, so this is going to be put out, recorded, but we're glad that everybody is going to be able to listen on their own time whenever they want. And I'm really excited to be in the presence today of the good doctors, uh, Helen LaKelly Hunt and Harville Hendricks. So welcome, both of you. Uh, I've, been really, I've been really looking forward to this. And many people have texted me and said how envious they are that I'm having this conversation with the two of you. They said, oh my God, I love the two of them. I can't believe you get to talk to them. So um, I've been really anticipating it and excited for it. And yeah. we were having a really interesting conversation at the, at the beginning. <laughs> Before we got on, we were talking about quantum physics. So just as the audience knows, that's the level of conversation that goes on. Sometimes before these things start, we're not even talking about the topics that, that we plan to cover. But what I wanted to start with um, is a bit of, a bit of background uh, on both of you individually and, and as a team of how you got here. Okay. Um, well, the background goes way back because um, uh, we've been together for 40 years, which means that I'm now in my 85th year, so it's a it's a long way back. And <clears throat> I started as a teenager as a um, as a minister and a pastor and an evangelist, and decided that wasn't my life work. So I became an academic, uh, and got PhDs and uh, other other degrees, and taught in a university, and got married along the way. And in 1972. Uh, I think it was 1975, got divorced. And I was teaching a course on uh, marriage in a university and uh, got interested, really interested in marriage as an experience after my divorce. And so Helen and I met at a party. I was single. She had been divorced for a short while and she was single. So we started a conversation about how come we, uh, who are, you know, not crazy. So wonderful. Um, and we're so wonderful. Why would anyone divorce them? <laughs> who, who wouldn't love the two of you, right? right? Who wouldn't love us? So we got started talking about how come we're divorced? Why do, why do couples fight? Why do they get divorced? So we started a conversation in 1977 that led to a marriage ultimately and to a professional partnership which has been indispensable in the development of Imago relationship therapy. So that's sort of the on rank is that we started off discussing what we are now continue to discuss almost every day with somebody about how to, how to, have, a, how to have a great relationship. We think we've figured out most of the parameters or the necessary parameters of, of a thriving relationship and a passionate and joyful one. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you mention quantum, the Tao of Physics had just been published when we were dating. Uh, and by the way, um, my first husband talked me into marrying him. And, um, and it was an age of uh, women are subordinate to, my mother always said, do what men say. And women are, have subordinate status. Right. Did, you, did, did your mom imply that or your mom actually said those words? Do what men say. And that's how she was in her in her marriage. Well, I did that when I talked that this guy talked me into marrying him, and I thought this sucked. So I thought I'm going to propose to my next husband. <laughs> and we were both reading the Tao of Physics, and I, you know I found someone interested in what I was interested in, and we became thought partners. And so eventually, I said, Harville, would you marry me? And um, so that was uh, five years after we met. And then, yes, we've been married you, about five years, but we've always thought of um, the definition, or I think I came up, a definition of a, a, a self is a particle wave duality. Like we are relationship mm. and there, there's no such thing as just a particle. Everyone has a particle wave dynamic with someone, a dog, you know, maybe you're in a convent or Buddhist with other Buddhists and but the relationships is what make you a self. Did you tell your mom that you're the one that proposed? How did I, you take that? I didn't have a good relationship with my mom ever. Yeah. Well, 
she didn't take it very well and she didn't like okay. me either. So, um, cause I okay, was- Moving on, <laughs> to the mind. <laughs> moving on. So we, we uh, and, and so Helen, I think- I have, I, have a, I have a great relationship with everyone else, but yeah. I never liked this lady as a mom. Yeah. But I was very close to my dad. Yes, and she stopped listening to what men said. So yeah. you can imagine the conversations that- <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll listen if someone else listens to me too. Like, yeah. Well, I, I, I actually, I want to talk about something, Helen, that you were suggesting before we started the official call when we were talking about quantum physics, and you were talking about a relationship being that that dynamic, that space in between two individuals, and. Maybe without us giving a physics lesson here, I appreciate that you were talking about the particle wave duality that we all have. Um, who would have guessed we'd be talking about that on this call? But <clears throat> share, share a bit more about that, that the, the relationship really is the dynamic, maybe. It, are, you, are you saying like, it's not one person here and one person here together, it's, it's the in-between, not, not oh. the sum of these two parts got two people in the space between and if people will come to our formal presentation that'll be the first thing that we're invited mm -hmm. we're, we will invite everyone to think of uh, it's a radical idea people go the space between where well, there's nothing there it's empty mm -hmm. but we think of einstein and uh and the universe uh, and einstein said space is everything because space holds up you know, what holds up the moon? What holds up the sun? What holds up the earth? And then what makes it everything move in an order around everything? That space. And so space is very powerful. Um, I'll say two more things. Harville um, started talking about the space between one of my very favorite phrases that Harville has ever said is incompatibility is the grounds for marriage and people <laughs> so they think they're marrying someone who's just like them mm -hmm. and then they're married and they wake up one day and uh their partner's different and but harville will say you're drawn to someone different and then um and then also what i love is we have something called the physics of the space between when there's safety in the energy field, people can relax and feel comfortable and smoke a cigar and uh, or you know have a beer or tell a joke. Mm -hmm. But if there's anxiety, people uh, the relationship is ruptured. And in our workshop or our, our lecture, we will talk about the four things needed. Every every relationship that is ruptured can grow safe again with four things to do. Yeah. So I want to pick up on your space between thing and bit polarity, <clears throat> because the space between is not just a, a, a two words in a sentence. It's our operating a foundational uh, operating construct that this is where reality is, is in, and this is where human people live in the space between. And we make it the space between because that's a polarity to where psychology and psychotherapy um, and uh, even art and literature have placed uh, human experience as um, located in the within, which we have relabeled the space within. The old words for it are subjectivity or the inner world and so forth. So, and there's been an assumption in, in the therapy field since Freud that um, it was the within, that is the id, ego, and superego and their interactions. And he directed uh, the therapy process to explore the inner world with an understanding that if you explored it, you would find that there were unconscious conflicts there and they were a function of the interaction of the parts of that inner world of the superego repressing the life force mediated by um, hopefully a strong ego. And then that became a part of the psychotherapy field for 150 years, which is to study the inside world, explore it, 
And when you get it all figured out and your unconscious becomes conscious, you will then be okay or well or whatever the outcome is supposed to be. And as couples therapists over the years, we found that simply doesn't work in couples relationships. That you can help couples explore their past and their, in, their interaction with themselves and their memories and their dreams all you want to. It doesn't make the relationship better. Mm, right. What you do is do something different in their, their interactive interactions have to change. That can be helped by knowing something about yourself, but the knowledge of the self doesn't make the changes that have to be made in order to live in a thriving relationship. So we said the space within is actually created by the interactions of the space between, because the brain, the within, uh, records these interactions out here as memory, and memory becomes in, it becomes the inhabitants of the, of the space within. So you can tool around with memory all you want to, but all you do is a tooling around with the past. Right. What you need to do is create new things in the present to change the configuration of the memories that came from the past. And that's what we would call growth, change, healing, or transformation, all different kinds of words. But I just wanted to make the, that there's a polarity here. Space between is primary for us rather than the space within, which we think is secondary and a derivative in terms of its contents of the interactions in space between anyway. So that's kind of a okay. uh, academic statement about something, but it at least sets the parameters for a conversation. Let me, let me see if I'm brief, if, I, if I'm synthesizing this correctly, and then I wanna go back to something, um, Helen, that you said. Um, is it, it you, you're suggesting that basically working on the dynamic between you and another person is a greater priority than doing your own internal work, assuming that the working on yourself will then fix the things with someone else? Saying that, not, the, not that that's not important, but that prioritize yeah, the, the dynamic work that if you do the work in the space between, you simultaneously are doing the work in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Creating realities that are internalized as memories. And as you internalize new memories, the new memories change the old memory configuration so that you then change by what you take in, not by what you ex examine on the inside, you change by what you, what the new that you bring in. Yes. So so you, an, analo an analogy might be like eat better food don't try to don't try to dissect the food that's already in your stomach just keep eating healthy stuff put healthy in. put healthy food inside you and it will work and if you think about it a while the brain was the brain is uh, was created and according to the neurosciences fundamentally the brain deals with the outside world um because it's always been interested in survival Right. And its primary function is to not die. And so the only thing that the brain's worried about is something, not me, that might hurt me. So the brain is outside oriented anyway. So when we focus then on the quality of the interactive space, the brain's working where it works naturally. If this is safe, then the inside, then I'm going to be safe. So that changes my inside. If this is dangerous, then I could be killed. So that changes my inside. And then it becomes a basis for expectation about what's going to happen out here. So there is an oscillation between inside and outside. But the chicken is the outside and the egg is the inside. Yes. <laughs> if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah. Um, right. But it's but it's not even a chicken and an egg. Which one's first? We're saying which one's first. It's, it's, it's the chicken. The chicken is first. Chicken is first. Right. Yeah. Egg comes second. Uh, um, can we? I it grabbed me when Helen. I think you said. I think it was you that said. I, I basically heard you say. I think opposites attract. Yeah. And and, and I want to. I want to <laughs> explore that idea with. I want to see if you think it's, it's um. It aligns with something that 
my teacher, Neil Allen, who we did his book launch a few months ago, Neil and I talk about, which is you want to find a partner that shares generally your rhythms of life. That it, he said, like, if there's a hundred things in your life, you want to generally do about 80 of them in the same fashion as the other person, or else you two just sort of operate differently. Mm -hmm. Can you have that and still have opposites? Or like, are those opposing ideas? Or are they actually in alignment? I'll answer after I make a comment about nature. Okay. The comment about nature, guess what? It's dyadic. Wet, dry, dark light, sweet, sour, hot, cold. You know, everything. Uh, you know, there's spiders and there are giraffes. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of difference in nature. And bravo, we want compatibility. But to become compatible, you have to also be prepared for mm -hmm. difference to emerge and to learn to accept difference. So that is the biggest challenge in, in a lot of relationships. Now, uh, I love, so that's number one. Number two, that when you think about a, a life partner, it should be someone that shares rhythms. Did, did I get that right? Like that see things in a similar way. And so here, here's how I would respond. The beauty of people committing to do the dialogue part, uh, process of um and if you're living together or if your partner's in any other way, you're married or work partners or whatever, commit to using dialogue because this way Harvard can say something. I might see it a little bit differently, but the first thing I do is want to mirror him and say, well, that makes sense from your point of view. That makes sense. And then I ask for an appointment, may I share a way I see it also? And then I say, I see it a little differently. Could I tell you how I see it? And if yes, and if he, if he might go, well, I can listen now, but I, I actually can't listen now, but how about in an hour? And I'll listen to your thought in an hour. He said, okay, so you always ask for an appointment before you start a dialogue. So in an hour later, I said, you know, an hour ago, you said so-and-so. That made perfect sense from your point of view. Here is how I see it. And Harville mirrors me. <clears throat> we think the dialogue process creates the rhythm. That, that two people who commit to using dialogue, they are insured to have a shared rhythm no matter what. Now it is great to if you make if you want someone in your life explore how how much do we agree on, so that makes sense. But uh, nobody's going to agree with everything, and so the my answer is a commitment to using the dialogue process, which which is a different way to talk. Since history, people have talked in monologue, so we're teaching a new way to have a conversation. Ah, okay. When you were saying the dialogue process, it, it took you saying monologue for me to realize the importance of the dia in dialogue. I was just thinking of dialogue as in people talking. Now I get it. Well, well it is, but it's talking and listening. Yeah. And that looks what's in Washington, D.C. And looks what's going on in India. And look, it, it, you know, we're scared about World War III. So we think that the dialogue could help a lot with the world learning to live together on the planet. Well, talk a little bit about, I, I know you two are very well known and this conversation so far has been about relationships with romantic partners. Um, but I know you also write and teach about how these communication skills can be applied to any, you know, I mean, you know it doesn't have to be somebody you're in love with or dating or you know or been married for 50 years um you know you just alluded to governments could be using these techniques and these approaches um do you find 
that when maybe people work on the dynamic in their relationships, is it, is it easy for them to take those lessons and say, well, now I'm going to talk to my friends differently. I'm going to talk to my coworkers differently. I'm going to talk to people in a store differently. So let me tell you what happened when Google decided to study. We have a good product, but what makes a good business? They create the products. And they spent, spent a couple of years calling <clears throat> what they eventually called the Einstein pro project. And they said in every business, you know, this is, and then Google began to function. For the team, for the professional team to work together, they need safety, structure, and a couple other things. And if you look up Einstein project, this is, this is how businesses are beginning to run using things like and what what creates safety in the between is structure so um but anyway businesses are already getting there and um so the answer is yes we're businesses are longing mm -hmm. to know how what to bring into their businesses where there's more safety and structure mm -hmm. yeah add to that <clears throat> and how people talk to each other it's couples are just a subset of the human situation. And so what works, and that's why we are now have launched a global social movement called Safe Conversations, in which our goal in, is to teach people to have safe conversations, teach the planet. And our goal is in 30 years, we will teach or actually train and, hope, and help integrate three and a half, 3.8 billion people into this new way of interacting with each other. That's the tipping point of the world's population in 2050. And so we are, um, we are hoping by that time to be able to <clears throat> destabilize the culture we now have, which is based on the individual and the individual as priority, and which is rooted in the value systems of competition, control, made the winner take all, we think those are actually not healthy, that what's healthy is freedom, inclusion, celebration of diversity, um, and, um, and universal equality. You gotta have, you gotta have those, those, that's what makes us a human community is that we're all equal, we're all free. We celebrate our diversity and we're all um, so forth. Um, so we're working on that, which means that what we did was we took dialogue which was the therapeutic intervention in couples work, discovering that it was the dialogue that changed them. It was actually not their insights that changed them. It was changing how they talk to each other. Mm. And when we change how they talk to each other, 90% of their problems disappeared because their problems were functions of their inability to connect. Yeah. Once we helped them create to talk in such a way they created safety in the space between, then they could connect and, con and lack of connection was what they were complaining about. They were just, you know, we don't have enough sex. We don't spend enough time together. You don't want to do this. We can't even agree on dinner. Where are we going to go? You know, all of that was all relational, but they didn't know how to talk about it. And so I discovered along the way, that if I help couples talk differently, and that's where Helen introduced dialogue into our relationship in 1977, I was not doing that with couples, but Helen, we were having a big fight early in our relationship, not our marriage, but in our courtship. And, and Helen said, hey, let's stop. One of us talk and the other one listen and take turns. And we both come down with, she went into her prefrontal cortex and directed instruction to our amygdalas and we did that and i was so impacted by what that did for us that i then took that to the clinic and working where i was working with couples and said we're going to do something different here uh you're going to talk and you're going to listen and we discovered listening is the hardest thing people have doing because the talking is easy but then they polarize when they talk instead of connect so we, it took about 10 years to work out all the details of the dialogue process so that it works elegantly. And now it became the only intervention we use with couples. 
So it worked there. And so uh, we had a conversation about 15 years ago in which I was kind of at the end of my career as a couples therapist and was interested in doing something else. Then why don't we take because dialogue? He, he had trained a lot of therapists to train. So when, that what, was the, yeah. we're at the end. And, and so why don't we take dialogue <laughs> out of the clinic and put it into the public domain and teach everybody how to talk? And we ultimately rephrase dialogue as safe conversations, which is talking without criticizing, listening without judging, and connecting beyond your difference. And if you can do that, you'll have a great relationship, whether it's with your kid, whether it's with an employee, whether it's with a colleague, whether it's with your grandmother, or whether it's with your mother-in-law, or whether it's with anybody, a politician. If, think of politicians would uh, listen until they got it, like you did a few minutes ago when you said, I want to see if I got this, I want to synthesize what you're saying about this inside and outside stuff. Well, if you just stop and say, let me see if I'm getting that. Then you mo move into connection. And then you can go into creativity, to curiosity. Then you can go to creativity. But if you are always monologuing, which we call it parallel monologue, all you're doing is two, two fire hoses, you know, shot, uh, spraying water, but they don't do anything. You have to have this interaction so that something happens. I, okay, I have to go back and ask another question, but I'm having this visualization of like, you're a basketball team and you can practice dribbling all you want, but if you, if you, never, if you don't know how to pass, you're not really gonna be a good team. You've got to... Okay. I, you've, you've got to learn how to pass. <laughs> Practice passing until you can pass accurately. Oh, that's right. I mean, and you can shoot baskets. Right. But, but like, you've got to pass. Passing makes the team better. And that's what I was, that's what I was like seeing as you two were talking about the conversation between you two is what makes the relationship. We looked up with this. That was a good point. <laughs> What's that? We'll pay you a little bit. Would you like to do what? I would love to. I would love to. Yeah, I would love to. Um, yeah. Sorry, you were cutting in and out. Say that again, Helen. It's a joke. I think you um, have to do. You okay. already have to do probably. But I would love to hang out with you guys more. Um, I, I have a very simple question that I've never asked, and you just brought it up. Of why is it so hard to listen? Even though... And it's like, I get ego and, and I get when we listen, we're often listening and synthesizing and most of our energy is devoted to what we want to say. We're listening to have an answer, not really listening to understand. But, but then I think like, but we all love being told stories. That's just listening. Like who doesn't love a good story? So if we love a good story, and kids love stories, so kid, that's our natural state. We love stories. Why do we not love listening? No. Great question. He has an answer, and then I'm going to share something. Okay. So I'll give you a, a, this is, I suppose, would be considered a very technical answer, uh, although I hope I can make it really human. So uh, the technical answer is that every infant coming into the world for all of human history, came into a world joyfully alive and feeling great. And they had caretakers who for a little while res uh, resonated with that joyful aliveness. But because adults have to go away or sometimes they don't like babies or whatever, they rupture the resonance with the infant. And a sensitive caretaker will uh, hear the baby cry and come back and reconnect. But sometimes, and most of the time, the baby's signals don't get responded to. So this rupture we call the primal human injury. Everybody's ruptured. So the baby goes inside now and it cries and it discovers, I get something and I get a response if I cry. Uh, and then there are other babies who cry and they don't get a response. They go silent. Then the parents come and look. And so the baby registers. This is very early and it's not, not, nothing cognitive, just emotional. I get a response if I'm quiet. 
So we pick one or the other of those, and those are our life defenses. But, but nevertheless, irrespective of that, what the baby starts doing is create a map of the world in its brain. And it keeps building that map over time. And this map is the map that is the baby is internalizing from the outside world. But that map, um, it becomes the baby's map to the world. Now, what happens is that, and this is where it gets really technical, the baby discovers that if it stays inside and big, continues to build its own inner world, um, then uh, it's okay. But if it goes outside, then there's conflict because the caretakers or somebody's gonna say, no, that's not right, do it this other way. So we, all of us go inside and we construct our inner world, our inner subjectivity. And that what we create, what we call a symbiotic consciousness. And that is, we also believe, develop the belief that the world that we see is the world that really is. We do not know that the world we see is an interpretation. Of so the symbiotic consciousness then has its own insulated inner world, which is why we we're saying earlier, you can't just analyze that and get anywhere. You actually have to engage the outside world. So listening would mean I have to actually allow something in. So this is my world. I have to actually open this and allow something into my inner world. Um, and if I do, my inner world changes. So now I don't know what is real. So I close the door. I know what is real when I don't let stuff in. So I shut this down. So because uh, listening, listening, you know you're listening when you're changed by what you hear. Otherwise, you're just hearing. And if you live in a symbiotic consciousness, you're hearing and waiting to say what your world is. But if you're listening, you're hearing and waiting to say, hey, let me see if I'm getting that. Is there more about that? And you tell me that. So you go to curiosity and you go to empathy. Hey, that must feel terrible. But if you don't have this, this capacity and you only have it when you're safe. So we all come into the world, the short kind of say, we all come into the world with an open curiosity to the world that gets shattered. So we go inside and build a world in which we feel safe. And it's very hard to let anything different from our world into our world, because that means it changes. So that's a kind of technical thing. It makes it hard to listen because listening creates anxiety. And can I add two things? Please. So my answer is that um, in our society, we're rewarded when we talk. Mm. Uh, from the very beginning as babies, if our parents, if we say something with the, our moms call a neighbor and go, oh, she just said a word or, you know, and then, uh, you know, often mothers and fathers are raising kids who are the same age, like they find other parents the same age so they can know what to figure out what to do. And well, my, my son, he is da, 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 speak, beginning to use sentences and, you know, they were sort of, you know, oh, you're so great. You said it. Well, anyway, you're rewarded when you talk when you're a little one. You're rewarded at school. You get better grades uh, if you win the debate team. If you do the best book report, and if you graduate, you know, with a lot of A's on your thing, you get accepted into college. In college, you know, if you go on and and you write better papers, left brain stuff, you can get to graduate school. You begin to make money. The more you better you are in business, you get more money. You have more cars. You get more homes, and um, so you're rewarded if you talk and no one rewards you if you listen. That's number one. And quickly, the number two Unless is- Unless you're a therapist. Um, <clears throat> the, um, <laughs> number two, but you have to market yourself. Yeah, they don't. But anyway, number two is um, um, if, if people learn about the brain, they will know if they listen, it can put them in this part of the brain that relaxes them. And, the, and how people normally respond in a relationship is if Harville says something, I react to what he says. 
either agree or disagree. And if I disagree, I let them know, you know, if I'm not using a process uh, called dialogue. And so, you know, uh, conversations are confrontational. Um, and a dialogue, uh, when you structure it, it put the synonyms of dialogue put you in the neocortex, out of the amygdala, out of the lower brain. The lower brain releases uh, adrenaline and cortisol and you feel bad. The upper brain re releases dopamine, acetic nor acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, relaxing neurochemicals. The left brain, as I said earlier, logical knowing, right brain connected to not knowing. This part of the brain is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain doesn't know. It wonders. And a noted brain science just says it's, it can tolerate ambiguity. And this is the healthiest part of the brain and it, it results in neuro, neural integration. Mm. I will say personally, I know what it was like to be another way. And more and more, I love listening to Harville instead of talking. And I, and I love not knowing him. And I love being silent when I'm with them because I am happier. I feel better. I'm, I, I don't, it, I think he's happier too that I don't talk as much, but I'm happier. I mean, that's the point I want to make. I am happier. I feel better. I'm more relaxed when I listen. Yeah. And also I like not being known. I that, that is beautiful. I just want to say, I, I love, that makes me so happy to hear. It's so cool. Thank you for saying that. One time. Yeah. Uh, years of talking to figure out, shut up. Yeah. And so, and I like. It doesn't matter what I say. And I'd rather, I'd be happier wondering instead of talking. Yeah. And so, this is the thing. Yeah. She's wondering because if she, quote, knows me, then I'm what she knows, but it's not me. So, then when I'm not what she knows, that creates conflict. But if she doesn't know me, then I can be me. And when I show up, since she doesn't know me, then we can engage without all the predications that preceded that. So if she knows me, she puts me in a box and I put her in a box if I know her. And then I have to behave like I'm in the box or she gets upset uh, and said, hey, you can't do that. That's not the right thing to do. Right. So I think not put people in boxes and let them be what they are in the moment that they are that and go with what comes next. You know this in your, in your processes, then go with what comes next and then you don't run into the conflict. The answer is you'll feel better if you listen more. Yes. Yeah, and I, I think what the knowing and the not knowing, I'm thinking of something my teacher Neil and I talk a lot about, which is staying curious in, yes. every, in every moment that you can and yeah. that, I think, I think he said to me in the past, curiosity equals joy. And I think of it as, as presence. Staying fully curious is being fully present to, to whatever it is, to the moment. Because when you think you know it, right, you're creating a separate, a separate reality of it, a, se a separate hallucination of what's going on. It's not really going on. Well, and you know, we talked earlier about quantum physics. The idea that you could know something and contain way, way it. To bring this, way to bring this back. Nice, nice job circling this back to quantum physics. Bring it back. That in classical physics, the atom was uh, uncuttable and was solid. And uh, it was uh, separated and isolated and independent. And it, you know, it interacted with other atoms, but wasn't connected. In quantum physics, you have the opposite. You have the, um, they're still atoms, but they are connected intrinsically. Uh, and uh, they interact all the time in, in varying configurations. So when you come back to, uh, to quantum physics, then you really have uh, in it most specifically a principle called the principle of uncertainty, which is there's no way that you can know anything because uh, about anything. Yeah, if you know the position of something, you can't know its speed. And if you know the speed, you can't know the position. Yes, yes. So 
about half of half of anything that you thought you knew. You only know half of it. So why say I know where I know about this particle? No, you only know it's there, but you can't know how fast it's moving. You only know it's moving fast, but you don't know where it is. And that's true of life. You just don't know. So the best thing to do is, and you know that when that when you say it's there, then it becomes there because that's where you looked. And when you say, I'm going to measure the speed, you see the speed, but you can't see the there. So life is not certain. Un uncertainty is it, and life is not definable. But we're, it, we're but the, the, the pull of the brain is, the brain really wants to know where it is and how fast it's going at the same time. And in the classical physics world, you can know that. But in the quantum world, the one of the biggest discoveries was the indeterminacy of things and indeterminacy became determined. De, de, determinism was a part of classical physics. Indeterminacy is a part of quantum physics. It's a whole new world. Well, I think um, it, it, this has certainly been a, uh, an unpredictable conversation that we've had here. So I think that's, I'm gonna pull that little thread out from what you just said. Um, whoever would have guessed we would cover quantum physics multiple times, basketball, eating habits. Um, we didn't even talk about love, which people would assume we're going to talk about. I love, I really, the monologue versus dialogue dichotomy is something I feel I'm going to think more about. And, and I feel that is that is something that I think in the moment in a conversation that I would that I feel capable of reminding myself is this two people having a monologue or is this a true dialogue and I think just even that recognition of move into dialogue state move into di like I think I need to just keep hammering that idea into myself and it'll become a practice and mm -hmm. I would actually I'm going to commit in fact I think I want to commit to doing that for the next month really focusing on that and then I think I'll write maybe like a blog or a journal piece about it and and share how that's worked. All that being said, y'all have a class coming up. I want to make sure I've got the date and time right. Wednesday, July 28th from seven to nine o'clock. Um, authentic love, a new way to talk and listen. Briefly, what would you like to say about that class without <clears throat> giving away? I love how this was not about the class at all. This was just like, this is great. People can get to know you. They don't already know you. And also they get to see what's inside your brain to be curious, which I feel like the three of us have been continually curious throughout this conversation. So it's a, a nice example of what that can, how that can exist and what can come of that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we can just end real quickly. Um, but I said to Harville, you know, there's an interesting phrase I was thinking about when I woke up, the law of love. Um, you know, that's our expertise. Um, and people don't usually put those words together. But um, I mean, I think that what, you know, I think you need to coach us more on what you think should be the priority. But basically, we'll be addressing what we've talked about in this, um, well, basically the four things that create safety. Oh, beautiful. That yeah. there is a process of, we can, well, and we'll describe them in details. This is the law. Well, it, we call it the physics of the space between. This is how the space between works. You don't have to be controlled by it. You're the one that creates either safety or anxiety in the space between. So take control. Yeah. And I think the, what I would add as a close out is that um, the, what we're going to help people do is uh, what we talked about today about dialogue, listening, talking and listening authentically. But the problem all, and this is a gross thing to say, but I believe it to be true. The human problem is the rejection of difference. And in order to authentically love, you must accept the fact that your partner is not what you think she or he is, not who you think he or she is. And they will never become what you want them to be. 
they will always be themselves. And authentic love is loving what is, not what you wish were. Right. And the way you it cannot do that unless you come to know who this person is you live with. And you can't know them if you're always always in monologue. And think of you the can, other person as you a can, wonder. You can only know They're them. They're a if wonder. You, you can only know them if you go into a dialogue process. And, so, then, and then you never really know them. And experience, 100%. And experience them as a wonder. And that's their beauty is that they're different and you get to wonder about them. Um, so that's sort of what we'll do. I like that's a, that's a beautiful summary. Uh, thank you both for this conversation. I mean, the, and, and the curiosity and, and the backstories and talking quantum physics. And uh, I'm really excited for the class. I'm excited to practice what I just suggested about my practice of dialogue. Um, just thank you. All right, this is this has been a lot of fun. I really love spending you have, time with you. You're a lot of fun to talk to. Thank oh, you. Thank you. We often, thank you. Often get, a lot of fun to live with. We often get questions and we answer them. Another question, you answer it. What I love about this is the organic quality of yeah. the flow of the, and that you would direct it here and there a little bit, but fundamentally we we had a conversation. And thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that. All right. See everybody later. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye bye.